Bishop Revival and hear more. Friends from Moorhead State, University of Louisville, University of Kentucky, is that right? K-State, maybe? Not K-State, but those other three. Gospel choirs from those schools. Uh, your father, your uncle will be here Wednesday, Wednesday night. Bishop Revival here at GBC, nightly, Wednesday, excuse me, Monday through Thursday at 7 o'clock. Also, by my request, that song was the closing song at my ordination. Some of you were there, and then they scheduled me to give the benediction immediately after that, and I cried the whole way through it. I managed to keep it together today, so we're ahead of the game. Turn with me, if you would, to the Gospel of Luke. We continue with the next leg in our sermon series Studying through the Gospel of Luke, we're not far now from moving into the second book written by, uh, by the same author, the book of Acts, which we will start studying this spring, and, and the study of that book will carry us into the summer. The next leg of this journey, of course, begins after resurrection. It begins with Jesus walking triumphantly, victoriously out of the empty tomb. Last week... On Resurrection Sunday, with Easter joy, we celebrated that in walking out of the empty tomb, Jesus exposes the lie of violence. We talked about how violence looks to be powerful and strong, but really it is puffed up. It is a straw man. It is a house of cards. It may tower over. It may be terribly intimidating. But the truth of resurrection brings all of that false power tumbling down. Of course, there's just one problem, and that is if you've at all paid attention this week to the news, to our world, you know that in an always violent world, this has been a particularly violent week. I won't get into it just now, but, but you could find stories uh, with a simple Google search or a visit to the library, looking back at the front page headlines of the last week, violence from Easter celebrations in Pakistan and sister churches in Memphis. It goes on and on, the violence in word and in deed from the past week. And so in a week like this, following the promise of resurrection, it's only natural, in fact, it's quite appropriate to ask, how does the resurrection hold up to violence such as this? Another way to ask that question, where is God when violence happens? If the resurrection is the victory, if Easter Sunday is the celebration, where is God when violence is persistent in our world? And today's passage of Scripture deals with that exact question. Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 13. Now on that same day, Two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. And then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place here in these days? And he asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. 
But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. Verse 28. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Two disciples are walking a significant journey. Seven miles is more than I walk, even if I'm wearing my Fitbit. Seemingly two of the disciples, but not of the twelve, or at this point of the eleven, are walking to this little community of Emmaus. And their experience along that road has a great deal to teach us about the resurrection and violence. Because they themselves are wrestling with this specific issue. They know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, unequivocally, of the violence of Roman crucifixion. They have witnessed it. Some of them have seen from a distance that Jesus himself was crucified. They know of his death. They know with, cer with certainty of his burial. And yet there is also this whisper, this whisper of a claim, of an idea, of a hope, perhaps made manifest, maybe even more so than in the fanciful dreams of a group of women who went out to the tomb, a whisper of a hope of resurrection. And so they're talking about it as they go. They are entertaining the very same question that Christians, billions of us around the world, are wrestling with today in light of the violence in Easter week. Where is God when violence happens? Or how is the power of the resurrection victorious over the evil of human violence. This morning in this passage, I'd like to lift up four examples, four ways, four partial answers to those questions. How we know that God is near and active in a world of violence. First of all, God is near when we wrestle with questions of faith. God is near when we wrestle with questions of faith. Verse 14 tells us what they're talking about. They're unpacking, they're deliberating on what it is that they have experienced and heard over the last several days in Jerusalem. They're talking about all these things. But immediately after that, verse 15, I would suggest, is one of the most profound verses in all of Scripture. If you are someone whose spiritual discipline is to read in the Scriptures on a daily basis... 
copy down verse 15 on an index card and put it in your Bible to be your permanent bookmark. If you're someone who grew up playing football in a tradition where you ran out of a tunnel someplace and laid your hand on a sign before you took the field, whatever was printed on it, you might print this out and put it over the door to your house or the door to your vehicle. Put it on your mirror, put it in your sock drawer, someplace that you will see it. These words matter. Verse 15, while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them them my god what a powerful phrase when we are wrestling when we are talking and discussing about holy issues when we are trying to see where god is present and active in our world when we are even in disagreement with one another but trying to examine the holy life jesus comes near to us he is in our midst he is in our presence when we are speaking of such matters Talking and discussing. The New Revised Standard Version says it. Other translations put it differently. If I were going to offer a, a sort of very strict translation of my own, it would say something like this for verse 15. And so it happened that within their bond, as they were discussing with one another, Jesus appeared among them. This is one of the reasons that I love our Sunday school class. David and Mandy are grinning at me. We do this every Sunday. And you can predict, if David says something, there's a certain person across the room who's going to say something else. And it is wonderful and holy to see us reason together with faith-seeking understanding the differences that we have in our backgrounds and our perspectives that yield holiness. Jesus is in our midst when we do such things. I saw it again this morning. The news headline used the word attack. Attack. The context, as you read the article, the context was that a person in political leadership was responding to a series of questions about something that was happening in the world and offered a different strategy, a different opinion. Attack. When did that become an attack? That's not what that word means. Horace knows. When you publish, when you entertain ideas with people who also they themselves entertain ideas, to disagree with one another, to reason together, is not an attack. You may raise questions, you may critique, you may discuss, you may opine. But it is not an attack unless and until you live in a society that is so gripped by and addicted to violence that virtually everything is regarded as a personal affront or attack. No, God is near when we wrestle with one another, wrestle with the realities of evil. Secondly, God is near when we look for the holy in the rubble. When the house of cards comes tumbling down, when something that is beloved and cherished comes crumbling down, and we look for the holy in the rubble, in the leftovers, God is there. God is there. Verse 27, as they walk along, Jesus begins to interpret things for their understanding. Verse 27, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scripture. I've heard it said so many times and, and, and it's said so appropriately. That when suffering is inflicted, when shots are fired, when bombs explode, when accidents happen, it is a wise practice to look for those who are running toward the trouble. Look for those who are rushing in. Watch for the first responders, be they in uniform or in plain clothes. Watch for those who cannot stand looking on as others are suffering and they rush in to help themselves. That's very appropriate. I would simply add to that comment. 
as you are looking for those who are running toward the trouble, also look for the holy. Also look for God. Look for first responders who are persons of faith and do what they do because they love the rest of creation. They do what they do because they care for others who are in uniform. They protect and serve out of a sense of Christian calling and duty. Look for those who respond in other ways, those sort of soft second responders, those who come back in to help clean up the mess uh, relationally, psychologically, physically, those who come alongside and offer encouragement, a cup of cool water. Watch for those in whose lives the Holy Spirit is prompting a response. For God is near when we look for the holy in the rubble. Third, God is near when we get some skin in the game. God is near when we get personally involved. Verse 33, that same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. Remember, this is not like saying at the end of the service they got up and they walked down to Main Street. How long was their journey to get out to Emmaus? Seven miles. It took them all day to get there. The evening has fallen. They were concerned about their fellow traveler who turns out, out to be Jesus and have insisted that he stay the night with them. The journey's been so long. But when they realize who they were with, when they realize it's Jesus, they get up and head back to Jerusalem immediately. They put some skin in the game. They get personally invested with their lives, walking, traveling by foot under cover of darkness, repeating the same journey that just wore them out. They push against the limits of personal exhaustion, personal resources to go and share the good news. God is near when we put skin in the game. This is a congregation that has long been known for building bridges, for overcoming distance, for tearing down barriers. I want you to understand that there are a couple of ways that we can do that as an entire congregation, a couple of powerful opportunities over the next few days. The first one I've already mentioned, and that's the Bishop Revival Services that we will host. This is the fifth year. This is the fifth year, and, and, and we should celebrate that. that for, for five years now, the, 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 the college next door has turned to us and said, would you help us host this event? And there's wonderful music. There's wonderful, inspiring preaching. But more than that, the Bishop Revival is an opportunity for us to overcome some things, to tear down some boundaries, to bridge some divides that continue to exist in our community. In five years, can it honestly be said that each household in our congregation has supported the Bishop Revival? Let us tear down some walls. Let us build some bridges across some divides that remain and sometimes are growing wider and wider in our community and in our world. Now I need to go back and look, but I think it's also the fifth, fifth year anniversary of when we started Operation Inasmuch. And so that's the second opportunity we have in the days to come. Saturday, April 23rd, is our one-day mission blitz in the community. There will be opportunities. Some are very strenuous, exposed to the elements in the outdoors. Some, uh, my little girl will come and be seated in the fellowship hall for an hour before she has her ballet recital, first ever, tear, take a picture. Before she has her 10 o'clock ballet recital, she will come in here and stuff bags to be taken to the hospital for first-time mommies to have something to take home with their little ones. In other words, there's something for everyone on Saturday the 23rd. And we go into places in our community, streets that I don't normally turn down, 
lives that I don't normally connect with, realities that it would be, uh, frankly, uh, more comfortable for, for me if I were simply to ignore. But Operation Inasmuch reminds us of that passage of Scripture from Matthew chapter 25 that Jesus says, I, I, I am to have eyes that see and are on watch for the least of these. Sometimes when I look in the mirror, I see the least of these. And sometimes when we look around this room, we see the least of these. And sometimes it takes us going out into the community to be reminded that we need to be vigilant and watching for the least of these. The Bishop Revival, in as much day, these are ways that we overcome. We put some skin in the game. And God is near when we do this. And lastly, God is near when we break bread. Can you tell? Can you, can you guess which one of these four points is my favorite? God is near when we break bread, especially if it were to be, oh, for example, a Sister Schubert roll, right? Next week, we'll look at verse 41, where Jesus appears to another group of disciples and they don't know it's he at first and they only come to realize that it is Jesus in verse 41 when he says to them, y'all got anything to eat? There is something wonderful that happens when you and I break bread together. When we get together over chips and salsa, when we gather in one another's homes, when we have a cup of coffee, when people pour out their lives to someone who is across the table from them. And in today's passage, there's a very specific example. In verses 30 and 35, Jesus is doing something that's very familiar and beloved to us. In verses 30 and 35, verse 30 says he took bread, he blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Verse 35 tells us, that the, the disciples, these two men who have been traveling, they remember that as the moment that they recognize Jesus. Something about it, the way that he took the bread and broke it, perhaps what we think it has to do with the memory of what they shared with him in the upper room. It reminds them of the Last Supper. It reminds them of the way that he took bread from the table and broke it for them to see and spoke of it as his body broken, took a cup, gave thanks for it, spoke of it as his blood poured out. But in this memory, Resurrection Sunday memory of what Jesus did, a spiritual practice for all the church for more than 2,000 years is born. For it is in the breaking of this bread that we remember. We cannot, we will not stand aloof. Because violence against one part of the body of Christ is violence against the entire body. Those who were attacked at an Easter egg party in Pakistan last Sunday I was attacked against my little girl and Mr. Ray's children's choir going outside two Sunday nights ago to do an Easter egg hunt. That's an attack on Lyle Road when our godly missionaries from this congregation went out to carry mission, uh, Easter eggs. And yet God draws near. Despite realities that cause us to question and struggle, that cause us to have conversation where we wrestle and wonder and lift questions, God is near and God is drawing near. And in drawing us unto God's self, God is asking us to draw near to those who are suffering too. The resurrection life was one of the things about Jesus that he did not do uniquely. The resurrection life of Jesus is something that he shared with all of us. And he wants to share it even, even now. If you today feel drawn to this life 
with the one who draws near to us in our questions and in our breaking of bread and in our putting some skin in the game. If this is an introduction to a life that clicks with something internally, some questions you've been asking, a need, a want, a desire that you've not been able to put your finger on until today, then we want to invite you and welcome you to respond. Our musicians are going to lead us into a time of response. And if you would like to take that opportunity today, we'd love for you to respond. We'd love for you, if if you're ready to receive Jesus as as your Lord and Savior, won't you come forward and share that decision with us? If you recognize today that you need the type of Christian fellowship that we've been reading about this morning, you need these sisters and brothers in Christ in your life and you in theirs, and you're ready to be a member of Georgetown Baptist Church. We'd love to receive you. Or if you know that you need to respond by serving this week as part of the revival services or committing today to a, a, a registration page that you'll be there on in as much Saturday or some other form of response, we stand and sing today in hopes that you'll